My name's Jenny McGregor and I'm the uh, director of AsiaLink at the university and a very, very delighted collaborator with the Australia India Institute. It's um, been an enormous privilege to be part of the establishment and uh, a special privilege recently to help select the initial fellows. So we're very much looking forward to a long and prosperous future for the Institute. This session today, uh, understanding India's new public diplomacy promises to be a real treat and uh, welcome back from lunch and it's good to see so many people um, coming in still. We're going, to we're going to make a start because we really want to make this a session in which you get to ask a lot of questions. So we're going to finish the presentations by two and we welcome very much your questions and contributions. We have an incredibly distinguished group of people here today and uh, to speak, and the very first speaker is going to be Navdeep Suri. And this is a perfect place for us to start because Navdeep has been a member of the Indian Foreign Service since 1983 and currently heads the Public Diplomacy Division of the Ministry of External Affairs. Perfectly placed to give us an overview, which is what he's going to do, of India's current public diplomacy operations. He's going to particularly be focusing on the new uh, era of public diplomacy and e-diplomacy, so we're all looking forward to that. We then have Professor David Lowe, who's going to be moving us back from the present to look at the historical dimensions of public diplomacy. David is Director of the Alfred Deakin Research Institute at Deakin University. His recent biography of Australia's External Affairs Minister Percy Spender, Australia Between Empires, The Life of Percy Spender, was published in 2010. So he's going to give us the historical view. And then Nick Hill, who is Director, as many of you know, of the uh, Director of External Affairs for the Australia India Institute, will be looking at, I think it's going to be called speed dating diplomacy. So this is also taking us into the new era, Nick. And uh, Nick's, Nick's a specialist in arts and culture in India. He's, he's investigated arts patronage in India and has focused on the Tamasha Theatre of Maharashtra and spent two and a half years in rural India based in Pune. We then have a very different perspective from Amitabh Sinha who is a member of the BJP and has led several think tanks for the BJP, including the Media Cell. He has led the BJP's media strategies and party campaigns under LK Advani, and he holds a Master of International Relations and a Master of Philosophy. And I think we're going to have Amitabh looking at the whole role of the media in public diplomacy. So it's an enormous privilege to welcome these speakers and I'm going to first of all call on Navdeep. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, and a big thanks again to the Australia India Institute, to Amitabh and his team for uh, really uh, going out of their way to put this uh, magnificent event together. Um, given the diversity of the audience and the nature of the topic, I thought... Uh, let me start with at least what I think is public diplomacy. Uh, and to me, it means all of those activities that a government will in undertake to impact public attitudes uh, in a way that they create a more conducive environment for um, foreign policy to operate. And um, <clears throat> we've started working on some of these areas. To me, again, the four principal instrumentalities are using Indian soft power and projecting it, looking at this controversial idea of nation branding on which there is no great agreement between scholars of public diplomacy, looking at the area of strategic communications, which some countries do very well, India doesn't at this point of time, but we certainly are trying to, um, and then this impact that this whole phenomenon of social media um, has had on public diplomacy and what people call e-diplomacy, digital diplomacy, or um, by any other name. Starting with soft power, 
I think the, the, the idea of India, as it resonates and we see it around the world in many countries, um, is a very attractive, positive one that we need to build upon. Um, whether we look at it as a 5,000-year-old civilization with the association of yoga and Ayurveda and the classical Indian dances and music and everything else, and I can see that there's a smile on somebody's face when this notion comes up, um, or it is more contemporary stuff. Um, it could be Bollywood, it could be uh, the fact of the world's largest democracy, it could be Mahatma Gandhi and his ideals. And it is really quite phenomenal when we go around the kind of manifestations that we see. Uh, in a place like Bogota in Colombia, the verb with which Gandhi Jayanti, the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi on 2nd October is celebrated with street theater and other things, unexpected. Go to Senegal and an all black francophone group, never been into India, no colonial association, belts out Bollywood songs at a disco every Friday night. Um, you know, to me, these are elements of Indian soft power. And I think uh, I, I, if, if you ever get a chance to see, there's a video here that I'm not showing because of lack of time. But it's a quite an amazing video of this cop in Indonesia uh, who's in uniform um, at his desk. He's take, used a mobile phone, and he is lip-syncing one of the most popular songs from a few years back, Chhaiya Chhaiya. Um, and, and it went viral, and, uh, and, and people loved it, and he became a star in Indonesia. So I want to say that from a public diplomacy, going back to the definition of influencing opinions and attitudes, um, can we uh, use soft power in a much more coherent uh, way as a tool of diplomacy than we have. A lot, th lot of things happen, but they do happen in a disjointed kind of a fashion. There's a conventional view of what we're supposed to be doing in public diplomacy, and we're a large support unit for our embassies abroad. So we provide them films that they can do film festivals with. We commission documentary films that show different facets of India. We produce music and so on from with, with, with the music companies that our ambassadors abroad can give out as gifts. And uh, we, we commission books and we produce a magazine uh, called India Perspectives. Um, and we help our missions in kind of uh, undertaking activities that reflect Indian, Indian soft power. Um, we also have this interesting mandate that was given when our unit was set up about five years back, which is a broad range of activities that help in explaining India and India's foreign policy. And both overseas and within India itself. And one of our flagship programs in this that has really taken off very well uh, has been our, what we call our Ministry of External Affairs lecture series on India's foreign policy. And over the last uh, year and a half that we started this program, we've done 36 lectures in, in university campuses around India. Just with this essential um, thought that foreign policy issues are complex. They are increasingly intertwined with domestic agendas. It could be terrorism, it could be climate change, it could be WTO negotiations, it could be relations with your neighbors, but there is a strong domestic element. And if we as diplomats don't come forth to explain those issues or our position on those issues, then the uh, uh, public understanding or opinion on those issues is going to be formulated by some very strident um, sound bites on television uh, or uh, in the realm of politics, and neither is particularly healthy. Um, so we do quite a lot of things within India. We establish relationships with think tanks, the kind of dialogue that we've just had with the Lowy Institute in Sydney. We're working with in terms of uh, organizing our first ever international relations conference in Delhi, uh, which is an effort to bring together all the international relations experts from the academic community and get them around. Um, and we are talking to our national broadcaster to see whether India can have a truly global television channel, and that um, is, is work in progress. The second area I mentioned is nation branding. And as I said, this is a controversial area. Tony Blair tried Cool Britannia, many people remember, and it flopped after a very promising initial start. But you have examples of countries, Brazil as a country that sort of radiates a cool image, Germany, its whole campaign about Germany, land of innovation, 
land of ideas. Um, South Korea, the way it's positioned itself with its pop culture and so on. So you do have examples of number of countries that have undertaken campaigns um, to create a perception in the public mind of what they are about. And I think that while Incredible India was a great campaign and is a great campaign to brand India as a travel destination, is there a larger story that we can tell about India? Um, we were at Jakarta last year uh, for a conference and it was interesting that the CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies over uh, there, um, the gentleman came and he said he'd done a straw poll of his uh, um, fellows at CSIS and uh, said they were all very aware of the emergence of India, but there was no concern or worry about the emergence of India on the global stage as compared to say China or other countries. Is there an idea that we can build upon? It's one of those things that we are trying with. And particularly we are looking at how do we get young people to think India? How do we engage with them? Um, is there um, any template that we can use or do we have to create our own one? Um, a couple of examples of what we are trying to do in this space. We collaborated with the India Brand Equity Foundation, which is uh, an industry-led um, uh, organization in a fairly substantial branding campaign at Davos uh, in January. And the theme was India inclusive. Um, and so we had these uh, billboards and buses and uh, uh, the, the, the effort was to say that the emergence of India means markets for the world, it means opportunities for the world. Um, and of course our own interest in getting uh, FDI in technology. This is something that we are starting uh, from the 1st of October. Um, it's an ambitious campaign. It's going to be a global video contest uh, where anybody anywhere in the world can make a three minute video, put it on YouTube, um, and we are suggesting three themes for this um, campaign. India is creative, it's colorful, and India is wherever you are. So you could be Melbourne and be able to make a video that is somehow related to India and show your creativity. And we've got some really interesting prizes for these. Um, visits to India, fully paid trips. Um, Shashi Tharoor and Shekhar Kapoor have both come on board as brand ambassadors uh, for this uh, campaign. And it's again an effort to engage in a different way with different audiences around the world, whether it's the diaspora, whether it is uh, mainstream communities. And uh, the campaign itself will be open from 1st October to 31st December. And what we are doing is sending little bookmarks to all our visa offices so that anybody who applies for a visa between October and December gets a little bookmark in his or her passport which says, I'm going to India, make a video, win a prize. Um, so let's see um, how, it, how that works. There's another one that we are trying to do which is again specifically focused at university campuses. And here the little research that we did was that perhaps the best way to engage with young people is through contests. And if we can go, come to the business school here and challenge young people to say, you're doing an MBA degree, can you think of a business plan that collaborates, that involves a collaboration with India, any kind of business collaboration? If so, submit it and you stand a good chance of winning a prize. But this beyond that, we're tying up to have internships with blue chip Indian companies for successful uh, uh, participants and even create opportunities where the business plans can go to venture capitalists and so on to see whether you can actually make something out of it from uh, theory to practice. So we've done a few of these already and uh, it's a program that we are building on in other university campuses. The third area which I said which we don't really do very well is this area of strategic communications. And any corporate worth its salt would, do, would know this. Uh, corporate communication guys do this all the time. Um, what is your message? Who are you directing it? Who is it aimed at? And I think that we, from a public diplomacy perspective in India, need to do a fair bit of work in this area in particular. And the fourth area that I want to come to is the new dimension of public diplomacy. 
And I think uh, when people think public diplomacy, people think communication, they think of speaking. And they don't think enough of listening. Uh, and it's so integral now to the uh, whole theology of public diplomacy, where particularly in democracies like ours, governments are really struggling with this concept that we are speaking, but we are not being heard. And we are not being heard because ours is what? One voice in the hundreds that you hear from the 24-7 television, from the internet, from peer groups and others. And if you can establish a relationship, an engagement with your audiences, then the chances of being heard uh, are much better. And that involves listening. And so it bring up the, brings up this issue that are we using the right channels? Are we moving with the way the word is moving? Are we moving with the way people receive information, and particularly the under 30 generation? Uh, and, and my own feeling was that when most of what we were doing was subconsciously or consciously aimed at people like us, our kind of demographics. And unless we retool ourselves, uh, I don't think we have much chance of making an impact on that 60, 65, 70 percent of the demographics in many of our countries. So we started last year on our Web2 strategy. We started with Facebook and uh, YouTube and Twitter. We started this public diplomacy page, um, Indian diplomacy page on, on, on Facebook. We've just crossed 10,000 likes or friends, whichever way you want to put it. And it's interesting that we did a little bit of targeted marketing. And with that, within four to six weeks, the results were the largest community on this group, this 10,000, is Indonesians. The second largest is Egyptians. And the third largest is Bangladeshis. And Indians rank a distant fourth. Um, Bangladeshis. But I, I, I can come to that in more detail. Uh, what we are trying to do basically is put out information uh, that we think is relevant, but also increasingly put out information that we think is interesting, that it should be non-bureaucratic, non-government stuff, interesting stuff, but still stuff that doesn't get you into trouble. And that's a kind of a strange balance to make between, uh, you know, for, for, for a government entity. We want to see if we can use the power of Facebook to build communities of Friends of India. And it comes back to my initial notion of how we see public diplomacy. We've had this training program called ITEC, Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation, for the last 40 years, actually since 1964. And uh, what we are trying to do with it now is people who come for this ITEC training program to India, can we get them into a Facebook community? And this is a slightly old slide that I'm using, but it's actually crossed 800. And it's fascinating to see how a community is building up and engaging with each other, not with us. But they are posting photographs of their experience. They are posting comments about their experience in India. Um, newcomers are taking advice from people who've already been to India before. And, and so it's, it's quite a fascinating experiment to see how this is taking off. We told our embassies to start Facebook pages. After all, if what happened in Tahrir Square was being called the Facebook and Twitter revolution, then you need to be in that space to engage. And I'm really happy that many of our embassies have started bilingual pages now, um, like the one in Cairo, which is English and Arabic, uh, and uh, increasingly getting uh, used to put out and engage with young people. This is an Africa initiative that we started recently. And again, um, uh, India, Africa, shared future, squarely aimed at university campuses and students in Africa. Um, and again, uh, trying to build communities using Facebook. Um, I mentioned that we make films. So we started putting films on, uh, in short versions on YouTube. And we were surprised by the response, because these were supposed to be boring government documentaries. Um, who wants to watch a boring government documentary? But guess what? It's got 120,000 views, uh, and it's growing um, every uh, week. And so there is a market out there of people who are interested in this material. Um, we've started a photography competition on Flickr. It's called India Impressions 2011. And here the idea is that can we use crowdsourcing in an interesting way? Can we get people to post photographs of contemporary India on Flickr under a Creative Commons license so that they become available to anyone anywhere in the world to use with attribution. We use online publishing tools like Issue, and we use Twitter. And um, we've crossed 15,000 followers um, as of today. 
we are, again, very deliberately boring. We are trying to create a paradigm of Twitter being used by government in a way which is very different from the way individuals use it. I can't tweet that I got up in the morning with a headache. Um, but there is useful stuff that we put out. And um, it is amazing how it gets retweeted and goes to different constituencies. When we started this page, these are some of the reactions that we got within the first 48 hours. Um, people who were quite surprised that Government of India, Ministry of External Affairs, stodgy and boring as it is, is in this space. And it shows that apart from the efficacy of what you're doing, there's an e-image of your organization that you enhance uh, by using uh, this kind of medium. And one last bit before I finish, which is on the Libya evacuation, because we really did get quite a lot of credit for this, simply for putting out information about our flights reaching Tripoli in a timely fashion, putting out information about the evacuation from Benghazi. And while this was going on, we added about 3,000 followers on Twitter. So people were passing the information to others. Hey, guys, there's something useful being put out by Ministry of External Affairs in this space. But more interesting was, Suddenly, I started getting tweets from one gentleman that we didn't know from Chennai who was saying, you keep talking about Tripoli and Benghazi. What about Misrata? And we engaged with him. OK, what's the problem? He says, my father is with the Libya Iron and Steel Company as an engineer in Misrata. And he's there with 66 other Indians stuck there. And what is government of India doing to rescue those? I asked my colleague who um, was dealing with the evacuation. And he said, can't do anything yet. Ms. Rada port is closed. This guy tweets back, you're right, Ms. Rada port is closed. But I've spoken with my father, and the steel plant has its own jetty, and your ferry can come to the jetty and rescue people there from, from there. So this is some of the stuff that this is the guy, Seat, who says the port is with Ms. Rada steel plant. And he says that there are 800 other Indians around. Um, the, the port. And he's giving us this information. And if you look at the timelines, 1st March, 1st March. And on the 3rd March, we had our ferry uh, uh, sailing for Misrata. And as a result of this, this is the kind of comments that we got. And it's quite extraordinary, because I've been in government service for 28 years. All we get is brickbats. <laughs> you know, where did these people come from who are suddenly appreciating what we are doing? Um, <laughs> And these are people we, we, we don't know. Um, and this but one was very interesting that this, this um, fellow says, great job, hope there are no scams. This government is capable of scams over dead bodies. <laughs> and, and this next person, who's a very prominent anchor on television, says, keep your cynicism to yourself. And, 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 and actually makes the point that bravo to Ministry of External Affairs. And then that became the dominant theme. Thank you very much. I hope that these are some interesting elements. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you, Jenny, and, and also thanks very much to Professor Amitabh Mattu for inviting me to participate in what is clearly a landmark occasion. Um, like, like Navdeep, as someone who's long been interested in the formation of foreign policy, I'm, I'm very excited about public diplomacy and, and new age public diplomacy. But let me also put the view that it's timely to look back as well as anticipate the future, not merely as an academic exercise to explore historical roots of public diplomacy, but in a way that I think makes for better decision making in where to go next, especially in the case of perhaps a, a superpower, although that's debated, whose reluctant emergence is accompanied by significant ventures uh, of the type that Navdeep has been describing. There are three main strands of historical lineage that I think inform the idea of public diplomacy. And furthermore, they're not just remote origins from which the phenomenon has grown, but they remain, I think, close to the surface in current policy formulation and implementation in relation to PD. And therefore, they warrant remembering. So these three strands are 19th century adventures between state and non-state actors, uh, the rise of 20th century state-promoted propaganda, and the emergence of internationalism as one of the most enduring bedrocks upon which new forms of diplomacy can be launched. And in addition to these three strands of lineage, there are two further historical dimensions to the phenomenon that are only half appreciated. So three strands of lineage and two further dimensions. You can tell that I take my role seriously as a historian advocate. The first of the half appreciated is the role of history as a guide for decision makers choosing between what works and what doesn't. 
and the other is a need for what I would call a historical sensibility to accompany modern thinking about the slippery concept of national reputation. Now, in putting this case, I'm taking um, a generous view of PD as addressing a broad audience as a means of persuading others to want the same outcomes that you want. American commentator Bruce Gregory's elaboration seems about right, and it's similar to Navdeep's definition. He reminds us of the action and agency in public diplomacy. The key verbs, he suggests, are understanding cultures, attitudes and behaviour, building and managing relationships, and influencing opinions and actions to advance one's interests and values. I'd add that the means of persuasion needs to be either originating from government or at least acknowledged and somehow endorsed by government. Now, I'm an international historian rather than a historian of India, um, but I will try to steer towards Indian circumstances as I go. And um, I was educated at the Melbourne version of Halebury College, so it seems that I'm destined to do that in any case. Let me turn quickly then to my three strands of, um, three strands of historical lineage informing PD. The first one is the one that prevailed for most of the 19th century and featured, it featured shifting and loose relationships between nation states and non-state agencies, shepherding national interests in cultural transmissions. It's been suggested that the 21st century multi-dimensional mix of state and non-state forces involved in PD is something of a return, in fact, to earlier times, after an unusually state-centralised phase generated by the Second World War and then the Cold War. European examples of engagement with the United States in the 19th century are especially instructive. In France, the Alliance Française, founded in 1883, promoted French language and culture. It's a very well-known one. And prize-winning French artists found themselves on sponsored tours to the US at a time when popular opinion there was mostly hostile to the French. Um, you can make the same case for um, stirring academic exchange programs, including the Rhodes Scholarships, and European business groups setting up cooperative societies with like-minded groups in trading nations. Impressive individuals could transcend colonial circumstances, as was the case with Bengali seer Swami Vivekananda, who turned up uninvited to the World Parliament of, uh, World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893 and became de facto the, the Indian representative. An inspiring speaker, he brought Hinduism into popular consciousness, at the same time sketching its international reach in a way that captured diasporas and smoothed over divisions, and also harnessing it to the cause of Indian nationalists. As a conference gatecrasher, he did much to awaken the West to a Hindu spirituality that also harboured a morally superior form of nationalism. Now, whether or not the state liked these developments, and they were sometimes actually regarded with su suspicion and disdain, doesn't detract from their significance and success. In all cases, the state eventually caught up with these private initiatives, conferring some acknowledgement or endorsement. So stretching the argument, we might say that private agents and public-private partnerships in nation branding or PD have their historical antecedents as much in the 19th as the 20th century. My second strand, then, is one of the story of propaganda and the bureaucracy supporting it during the 60, first 60-odd 60 years of the 20th century, a period in which war-inspired ideals and modern bureaucracies added a new sense of propaganda grown by and harnessed to a burgeoning national security state. Now, while the term propaganda carries some negative connotations, it also has a close relationship, I think, still to PD, especially when we recall that um, Edmund Gillian, the, the dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts, widely regarded as the father of public diplomacy, said that he would have been comfortable with the term propaganda as something that covered his interest, but due to propaganda's pejorative implications, was forced to search for a more neutral umbrella term. Others took a bit longer to make the shift, and it was only in the 1970s that the US government's information activities made that terminological shift to PD and left behind propaganda. The pejorative feel of other terms, such as um, information warfare and so on, um, can obscure, I think, a basic aim that propaganda has always shared with PD, and they are dimensions of a nation's attempts to cultivate public opinion to achieve that nation's aims. One way that advocates of soft power would like, they're one form of persuasion orchestrated in national interests. Just as information affairs during the first half of the 20th century were dominated by two world wars, it was war-generated bureaucracy that enabled the growth of very big propaganda machines, especially during the Second World War. In simple terms, the war called for concerted efforts in the production of politically strong messages closely linked to the aims of key combatants. And these settings changed only slowly in the post-war years, partly because a new war, the Cold War, quickly replaced the last one, and partly because it would take time for new modalities and greater subtlety to grow. 
So stripped of its pejorative connotation then, the links between state-directed propaganda and recent state efforts in PD are strong. Third strand is the growth of internationalism, both at state and non-state levels, during the last century and the early years of this one. At the supranational level, the growth of the UN membership and UN auxiliary bodies from the late 40s through 1960s presented big, well-structured opportunities for PD. The timing of this blossoming, of course, coincided with India's emergence as an independent state. Early ventures in post-independence Indian PD, I suggest, were less bilateral than in the supranational context of the UN. Through the principles and ideals they championed, nations of the non-aligned movement stirring in the mid-1950s, and of course with Nehru as one of the founding fathers, reinforced the Charter's aims and promoted the further development of an international community. As is well known, Indian hopes for the UN were closely entwined with hopes for post-colonial India itself, and for humanity more generally. Gandhi's Quit India Declaration in Bombay in 1942 stressed that India's nationalism spelt internationalism, foreseeing the need for independent India to join a world federation of free nations that would ensure disarmament, general peace and security, address the problems of injustice and inequalities and prevent aggression and the exploitation of others. And of course Nehru's subsequent declarations and writing extended these ideas as we've heard, especially during the first decade of the UN uh, to 1956. Other Indians helped, including the impossible to, to forget Krishna Menon, um, but also in addition to, to him, Nehru's sister, um, Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit, who uh, headed the delegation to the UN and who was the first woman to be elected president of the General Assembly. And also India's representative to the UN Commission on Human Rights, Hansa Mehta, who was at the time also member of the Constituent Assembly. Now, this isn't, isn't the time to um, run through again um, Nehruvian hopes for one worldism, but my point is to remind everyone that this was a very public, broad-based, mobilising form of diplomacy. It was happening in a very international arena. One recent reappraisal of the period suggests that we see it as one of co-mingling or intermingling of ideas about post-colonial India and the post-colonial world order as well. It's a terminology that's perhaps less loaded with morality and identity, uh, which, but I think is useful for building bridges with current debates. And um, you can take other episodes, including the, um, the famous Dec Resolution 1514 in 1960, hastening the, the um, UN endeavours to force uh, decolonisation as another classic set case in this. Interestingly, too, Australia became involved. I'm a historian of the Colombo Plan, and the Colombo Plan and its information bureaucracies during the 1950s and 60s served similar purposes. Now, building arguments around the excitement of bureaucracies is, I suspect, risking um, your attention. So I'll move on. But as most forms of diplomacy are fundamentally about the management of change, so too, so do our arguments, rather, about what's new and distinctive about PD need to embrace, embrace the growth and changes in bureaucracies supporting diplomacy. But let me turn then to my, my two further uses of history before I conclude. Whatever happens today, um, one of them, I think, um, is, has an instrumental value and the other, I'd suggest, perhaps more poetic, if I can go out on a limb a bit. As a historian, what I'm about to suggest may sound like special pleading, but I do think historical grounding is invaluable. We're experiencing today a rise in diplomatic activity that coincides with a strong sense of transition in the global system or systems, wrought by fin financial crises of unpredictable timing and duration, and recurring threats of terrorism, significant power shifts, especially in Asia and the Pacific, and implied levels of policy, the need for policy coordination on unprecedented scale across and within nations, and in tackling the challenges of climate change. Not surprisingly, in this context, public diplomacy as a concept is bound to be overused and sometimes used, made into a panacea, I think. So my first pragmatic use of history then is as simply as a provider of lessons. I'm not alone as a historian wrestling with our possible roles in relation to PD. Historian public diplomacy expert Nick Cull has started to com compile historical case studies in public diplomacy, lessons of what worked and what didn't, if you like, and he calls for more, so that we end up with what he calls a public diplomacy playbook as next phase capacity building. And I won't go into some of the examples I could of what worked and what didn't. But the other reason for historical perspective is the value of history as, compelling, as a compelling narrative with the longer view and the power to evoke. Effective storytelling that's linked to felt and demonstrated truths is, after all, one of the most powerful means of persuasion or reinforcing a message. Well-known stories or histories tend to shape national reputation, and the best-known stories leave lasting impressions. 
The motto of one of the biggest and best known information services, the US Information Agency, was, after all, telling America's story to the world. I agree with Dutch commentator Jan Mellison that public diplomacy, including the new public diplomacy, when practiced effectively, runs at different speeds from the more traditional forms of diplomacy and often has the medium to longer term view in sight. Interestingly, Mellison is an authority on so-called new public diplomacy, emphasizing greater real time, greater horizontality, horizontality in communications by state and non-state actors and the blurring of the domestic and international in news domains. He suggests that public diplomacy should ideally be in tune with the country's medium-term foreign policy objectives and long-term aims. It builds on trust and credibility and often works best with the long-term horizon, he says. In the nearer term, he suggests, and I'll quote him, it's realistic to aspire to influencing the milieu factors that constitute the psychological and political environment in which attitudes and policies towards other countries are debated. Now, this is not for a moment to deny the new social media an important role in immediately reaching broad audiences and to providing a means for popular levels of engagement with the nation's projections and standing in the world. In significant way, the diplomatic game has indeed changed. But I'm thinking about those publicly aimed messages that will survive when specific foreign policies strike trouble. India's early forays in PD in the 1940s and 50s involved an intermingling, if you like, of Indian challenges and visions with those of the international order. And however incomplete some of the one-worldism um, might have been and some core, ideals, some core ideals in spite of this survived immediate gains and losses in foreign policy stakes. Therefore, if we don't ask too much of PD today, if we're content with an intermingling of state and non-state agencies or the milieu factors making up the environment that Mellison speaks of, then there's some compelling reasons for persisting with a historical sensibility. Finally, modern day India is well placed again, I think, not perhaps to resume Nehru's mission, but to occupy a role in world affairs that speaks to both universal and specific concerns. I was tempted at one stage in my concluding comments to um, describe India as a microcosm, but those two words just don't go together. But if we, if we instead still deploy the Greek schema, uh, the ancient Greek schema of the cosmos, India could perhaps be conceived of uh, in the role of man, standing between macrocosm and microcosm. Now, I'm not quite suggesting that India summarises the cosmos in the way that man was supposed to, but India's concerns, I think, still speak very readily to world concerns. And that's a strong basis from which to engage in popularly directed acts of understanding cultures, attitudes and behaviour, building and managing relationships and influencing opinions and actions to advance interests and values. Thanks. Thank you, David. A, a salutary reminder of the importance of history. Nick, thank you. We're on to speed dating, I think, aren't we? Speed yeah, I'll, make it, I'll try and make it quick. Um, Thank you, everybody, and uh, I thank the Institute for allowing me the opportunity, but whilst I'm up on the podium, I should also thank uh, all of our fantastic visitors, guests, and speakers who have come uh, under the auspice of uh, Amitabh's uh, indication, but also through the Public Diplomacy Division as well. Uh, it's been wonderful having these conversations. Um, I'm neither a public diplomacy practitioner, uh, neither am I a public diplomacy uh, academic. So these are reflections, really. Uh, but the reflections, having um, had a, an engagement with public diplomacy, particularly in this role, uh, over the last 16, 17 months. So um, I'm going to move on from there, but I've got a little confession to make. Uh, the Incredible India campaign, uh, I think, is fantastic. And I actually have a couple of the Incredible India DVDs that are distributed <laughs> around the world. And when people ask me about India, I actually use the DVDs as a means of kind of introducing them. They're, they're fantastic clips, and I actually still think it's a very good campaign. Um, I'm assuming, and I think I can curtail a bit of my uh, speech, I'm, I'm assuming a sort of pre-knowledge of soft power and public diplomacy concepts, and, and Navdeep's covered them off. But let's just say that, in my view, the power of attraction and cultural affinity can result in uh, an immense amount of international credibility. And I'm going to give you a quote, uh, and I, I know there are a couple of people in this room who will uh, be familiar with this, and I'm not going to give you the, uh, who, who this is from until the end of the speech, but it's worth reflecting on. If people got to know each other better, they would develop a sense of empathy for others, a distaste for war, and a desire for peace. So, technology, education, and economic growth are now superseding, or at least complementing, 
the traditional means of wielding power and establishing legitimacy. And a more cooperative, multilateral consensus diplomacy emerges as a crucial aspect of doing the business of international affairs. Values uh, such as a stance on human rights, energy security, terrorism, sustainability and democracy all make for appealing collateral. So a new public diplomacy is still, as it always has been, values-driven, at best genuine and integrated, but now involving civil society at its most eclectic, untidy and more than occasionally belligerent. And in the case of India, this involves vibrant, chaotic, garrulous and, above all, democratic agencies. And what's more, as we all know too well, there's a hyperactive, independent media, and I think we're going to hear a little bit about that, to shape our perspective 24-7 in a multitude of voices and shades of uh, political spectrum. And I think uh, it's an important aside this, but um, it's worth noting that, that uh, in the media in India, not all of those voices are in English. Uh, and I think we probably take that as read sometimes that it, it is for our perspective. Um, and I'd also note that the fourth estate in India, by the way, uh, is a part of the superpower that could never be described as reluctant in this context. <laughs> and in historical terms, uh, as we were so expertly enlightened yesterday, India's direction in, for instance, a, a non-violent, non-aligned approach to independence has been and is the global benchmark. And this is an excellent example, I believe, of how India has become adept and adept at nurturing and promoting these very attractive aspects of its values. These facets and these aspects of India are democratic, secular and pluralistic, and so they're very appealing. They're steeped in an extraordinary culture and heritage in all its you know, marvels, I suppose. Food, arts, literature, yoga, film, and uh, when I say film, uh, that includes, but by no means uh, exclusively, the films of Bollywood. And I'm glad to see that the three-minute film project has got up. It's a fantastic prospect. Um, it's a country of intellectuals, but now also of extraordinary entrepreneurs, such that India is now an economic player of significance, the kind of significance that's really head-turning, I believe. However, I'm, I'm also very conscious when I make these reflections, um, whatever I say about India, uh, there's always going to be multiple and diverse experiences of the country, and others will, of course, have completely different reflections. And that, that actually is now in that new public diplomacy mix, and I think it's terribly important. So a little bit about India's new PD. Um, I think it's widely acknowledged that India's public diplomacy activity has become extraordinarily dynamic, and I'm afraid to say at the risk of embarrassing him, the Joint Secretary has been instrumental in this complete step change in PD. In new and social media, we've just seen, uh, it's streets ahead. Uh, but also in terms of recognising how important public diplomacy is in a gender setting and the perceptions of India's policy, both foreign and, and very particularly, uh, and again demonstrated really well here with Navdi, um, internally as well. And I think this internal aspect of public diplomacy is often underrated. So I think the, the reflective part of public diplomacy and the feedback loop uh, has been very well demonstrated by NAFTA, but it's terribly important as well. And all of this is done, as indeed it's done on the Australian side as well, uh, with a remarkably small but very, very dedicated staff. So not only is the distribution of ideas um, very, very good, but also the, the quality of the content that India has is tremendous. So at the moment, I'm talking about India having a, a kind of pulling power, I'm calling it. It's good-looking, it's intelligent, witty, charismatic, it's kind of sporty, and it's got lots of fantastic stories to tell. Uh, and that pull, pulling power at the moment has got economic bells uh, on its ankles, and it's also got a trident in its hand. So there's a kind of verbal uh, and a body language of public diplomacy that I think is uh, sometimes quite visual. I would like to use the visual. And I borrowed the, the body language of public diplomacy from Rory yesterday. Um, and it's also very seductive. The way this is presented can be very seductive. Uh, and it's being terribly well um, choreographed, uh, but not by any bureaucratic or government intervention necessarily, but at the moment by a technologically enabled civil society. So the work of PD is happening through this feedback loop of the technology that Navdi began has demonstrated. And there's an audience of stakeholders from... Australia to Zimbabwe, including businesses, NGOs, individuals, and associations. So again, it's, it's this unbelievably broad audience. Uh, C. Roger Mohan, who's one of our eminent visitors, amongst others, has also talked about the diaspora 
as an asset of soft power. And public diplomacy. And I think it's important that the diaspora are encouraged to be ambassadorial uh, in international engagement. But I'd add another dimension, and again, this comes out very clearly in Navdeep's presentation. Uh, another dimension of the apparatus that's available is that anyone who has an interest in, a passion for, or a criticism of India from absolutely anywhere is engaged in the new public diplomacy. And these conversations play a part in shaping the values that are then fed back to us. However, notwithstanding this relentless activity, the relationship building, certainly in my reflection, does feel like speed date diplomacy. I'll tell you why. Despite this seamless move to a, a sort of tech-enabled public engagement, able to deal with all comers, this is a very, very crowded space. Lots of countries and their serried ranks of corporate entities are vying at the moment for India's attention. And though India is being resourceful in how to keep up with the potential suitors, it sometimes feels like a very, very brief encounter. So additionally, as has been discussed in this conference, there are contrary reports that don't always concur with the positive aspects of the society as it's promoted. And therefore, I ask a question. Is there a lacuna in the self-criticism that might inform or shape the ontology of public diplomacy policy, or do those stakeholders believe that, that it's, this balance has already been achieved? And again, I think we've heard from Navdeep that it's an endless flow. And now a little bit, forgive me, shamelessly doing this, but about the Australia-India public diplomacy interaction. You'd have to ask, uh, and many of our special visitors and journalists who come to Australia do ask this question, what's Australia got? And more importantly, what's in a relationship between India and Australia? Well, as it turns out, there's a huge amount. There are areas of convergence and comparison that abound, and many of these values that I've been talking about are very similar too. The only odd thing about this relationship is that we're so surprised to find out that this is the case. So, of course, economically, we've got aspects. We've got coal and gold and some other stuff we dig out of the ground. We've got services, particularly in education. Chickpeas, an extraordinary story there as well. And all of these have created a significant basis for the relationship to flourish. But there's still a really bad stereotype problem uh, for both countries. And that sometimes overrides the opportunity to discuss issues at a serious or, or a more nuanced level. And I, I believe that's beginning to happen now. So thus we need a place where genuine, legitimate and credible discussions can take place, where the contemporary India can meet the contemporary Australia and take some time to discover the extraordinary range of similarities and convergent convergence, joint interests and complementarities that we share and we can develop together. So this, on occasion, is very difficult. And as in the dating metaphor, it's often a little bit gauche, sometimes unsubtle, or at the very worst, disingenuous. And I'm afraid to say in a couple of significant cases, it's been absolutely disastrous. So part of what the AI is doing, and, and by no means on our own, is looking for and supporting champions and advocates for the relationship. And the evidence is that there are, there are a great many of those people out there, and they're not all just from the diaspora. There are also a great many people who pretend to that crown. And uh, I think because this is a long-term goal, and our aims are long-term, and I think the world of public diplomacy is endlessly patient, um, there's got to be a question about how we could achieve this. What can we do to achieve this? What are the things we can do? And how could we initiate and encourage this wider discussion? And actually, I'm going to use a USIA paper uh, called The Future of Diplomacy to identify the five things at the top of a list of 20 that were considered to be the most significant activities that one could undertake to achieve and measure a successful public diplomacy. They are exchange programs. And I believe we have very good exchange programs in place. Second, education exchange. I can't stress that enough. Thirdly, face-to-face -face engagement with local publics. Fourth, international visits. And fifth, and I think we're here today, dialogue with elites and opinion leaders. And those five things, those five things at the top of that list have proven to be the most effective. Now, I'd given time, give a, a reflection on why I think education exchange and exchange is important. But I can d uh, give a, a sort of personal version of that. I took my undertook my PhD fieldwork in Maharashtra, as Jenny said. I spent two and a half years living in Pune, and aside from the 
PhD and the, the work I did for the PhD, um, I had an amazing array of all the unexpected things that happened on the exchange. All the things that I was able to do that gave me a, I always say only scratched the surface, but gave me a, a different view of the India I'd arrived into, the one that I left. So I return to a reiteration, I think, of the first quote I gave you. And this is uh, US Assistant Secretary for State for Education and Cultural Affairs, and Stock, earlier on in this year. The bottom line is that the, and you may have got this quote now, it was William Fulbright, the earlier quote, that the Fulbright-Hayes mission fully embodies Secretary Clinton's concept of smart power by using all the tools available to achieve our 21st century foreign policy goals. Exchanges do just that. They bridge language barriers, open lines of communication, and connect people in immediate and lasting ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, and uh, welcome, Amitab. Honourable Chair, distinguished speakers, friends, I'm really honoured to address this August gathering uh, at this University of Melbourne uh, as a part of the group of uh, distinguished thinkers, communicators, and commentators who have been invited from India and obviously from other provinces of Australia as well. I am thankful to the organizers, especially uh, in India it is called Rashi Nam Bhai, uh, same name brethren, Amitabh Mattu, Dr. Amitabh Mattu. I am really thankful for, for him and his uh, uh, Australia India initiative to give me this opportunity to participate in this program, which will certainly bring our cultures and system, I mean, Australia, India system and culture, uh, more closer for each other, uh, each other's benefit. Uh, I have been asked to uh, provide uh, an insight into uh, the relationship between the media and the political party in India. I think in this session, in the public diplomacy session, talking about media is quite relevant because media, uh, you know, drives the public opinion. And public opinion is the key factor for public diplomacy. So I think media, uh, talking about media and its, uh, uh, um, you know, the political party's perspective towards media is important and relevant. That's why I think I have been asked to um, talk about media. Uh, no political party can survive without India. In, in India and in other parts of the world also, no party can survive without media. There is no such thing as bad publicity according to me. Uh, hence, irrespective of the nature of the publicity, uh, political parties need to keep media in good humor. Uh, not for anything uh, is it said that the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. I think uh, this uh, is uh, apt and appropriate uh, and relevant for all the political parties and politicians uh, every part of the world. In India, the importance of a political party is directly proportional to the daily media space it occupies in the national dailies and television news channels. It would be the worrying uh, factor for my party, especially because I belong to Bharati Janata Party in India. And the BJP does not get adequate coverage. It is really a worrying factor for me, at least, because, uh, correct me if I am wrong, uh, but unlike the West and even in Australia, uh, where just not politics dominates media coverage, in India we breathe politics every moment. So if a party is out of uh, the news about a week, it would call for introspection, not because they are doing something out of place, but because they are not doing anything at all. Before going down to the memory lane, uh, recollecting my interactions with the fourth state during uh, the period I was in charge of media wing of the political BJP uh, for almost a decade and a half, I shall try to recount the history of Indian media in brief. Uh, actually, uh, the Indian media uh, history can be traced right, uh, way back in the 17th century where the Bengal Gazette, the first newspaper, was published in India. 
and after that so many gadgets came but uh, they were not of much importance because most of them were just uh, were the mouthpiece of the uh, colonial powers but later on uh, when uh, first lok bal gangadhar tilak started his uh, um, kesari newspaper and maratha uh, the, uh, the new the media the newspaper started taking role into the uh, independence uh, war of independence and simultaneously uh, started giving uh, the reflection of public opinion uh, in general and uh, later mahatma gandhi also utilized uh, um, that uh, medium and he started newspapers like harijan and swaraj uh, uh, i think uh, after that uh, uh radio also came the that audio audio media came in 1927 in india uh, but it was generally in a state control so it didn't create any impact uh, um, yeah, as far as the public opinion uh, the re reflection of public opinion concern uh, it continued uh, till the you know 90 late 90s when the fm and other private uh, audio media started and through that uh, um, you know a very partial reflection of indian uh, public opinion started uh, getting space in audio uh, media uh, in in the visual uh, field i mean visual media uh, in, that is television in india television started in uh, early 50s but generally it was also under public control till uh, 19 uh i think 1995 the decade of 90s where uh, when the mushrooming of uh, you know um, uh, private channels started and uh, real news started coming in but uh, the most important part in 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 that visual media is nine, the decade of 80s where mrs gandhi the then prime minister of india she had uh, taken an experiment of low power transmission units she had established throughout the country and because of that experiment that expansion and reach of durdarshan uh, you know expanded like anything and uh, uh, it became the household name of normal indian family uh, but after this you know 1990s uh, mushrooming of uh, uh, new channels all hell broke loose when the mushrooming of news channel began this is my line uh, we may call it the breaking news syndrome you had this laughable claim made by almost every channel following any development that it was the first to hear the news 5 minutes before any other channel could hear it uh, then there was not enough trend journalist also to fill the number of channels but simultaneously the print media somehow maintained its seriousness and the edit pages of the newspapers in particular play an important role in shaping the opinions of the policy policy makers of the country <coughs> uh these days in india the media ethics also taking uh, you know a quite important role that in the de debates and discussion uh, of those people who are really concerned about the media and what is happening in the media circle uh in the foremost concern at the moment is what we call paid news what is clearly an advertisement of a political party or of a corporate house is increasingly being bandied as news uh, in which in some newspapers they do not even have the uh, uh, that uh, style to mark such as paid column as a sponsored feature and they just print it as news this is unfortunate according to me uh, i just want to uh, give a an insight that i happened to be part of the um, party's me election media campaign during the last two general elections even as my colleagues uh, who were sitting in the uh, campaign committee and i was also there we were finalizing the details of our advertisements in terms of columns centimeter square and fct any free uh, commercial uh, time, uh, seconds uh, the, the, the departments of various media houses approached us to tell that ours was an outdated idea and they would rather like to take a package under which they would portray our claims not as claims but as news gathered by their reporters the price for that uh, was obviously astronomical higher astronomically higher than the normal rates applicable to advertisement and commercials this trend in my view again is certainly unfortunate and uh, the debate must uh, 
be, I mean, started, it should be started that how it can be curved, because this is genuinely hurting and uh, uh, creating a negative impact upon media in general in India. But some, it is not always the journalist who is at fault. Sometimes his employer views uh, not only a certain story, uh, but also very idea of journalism differently. A certain newspaper who, which claims to be the most circulated among the, all dailies of the world is often maligned for renaming the portfolios of it, uh, its editors virtually as marketing heads, editor Delhi market, editor Mumbai market, etc. But it is not alone to give journalism a bad name. Nowadays, more and more media houses are briefing their reporters to suffice as sales executive. I guess this has happened because of a paradigm change in the terms of employment of journalism. <coughs> Since the liberalization of the economy began, earlier journalists used to be regular employees enjoying pension, gratuity, and provident funds, etc. These days, they are only two-year uh, contract. They are with no guarantee of renewal of the contract at the end of the term. These hired professionals are therefore in per perpetual fear of turning jobless and are hence ready to do their employers' bidding no matter what unpalatable brief they receive for, from their boss in the office. <coughs> and the hesitation can also be of the media house. Some of them are caught in a uh, warp of their own making. It is time warp or sociological warp. The English language media, for example, was reluctant to cover in the phenomena of uh, Sri Lal Krishna Advani's uh, historic Rathyatra in 1991. Initially, only the regional uh, newspapers were showing interest. It was only after the public interest in this issue grew tremendously that the English language media in India picked it up. And this reminds me of the hardworking nature uh, of the journalist as well. Uh, that deserves a special mention because you know all journalists are not like that. And especially the, uh, the people, the journalists from the reporting and the bureau, they are generally very hard working and professional by nature. I am giving the, uh, just an example. As a part of Mr. Advani's led march, which was to be traversed by train, during a concluding leg of the Yatra, Mr. Advani, to reach Dhanbad, uh, a town then in Bihar, took a Howrah Rajdhani Express. As night fell while crossing the territory of the state of Bihar, rumors were rife in the coaches that Mr. Advani could be arrested any moment. In anticipation of the arrest, all journalists uh, were just uh, stayed awake. They stayed, all journalists accompanying the leader stayed awake, standing in the coach right next to uh, Mr. Advani's coach whole night. That night gave me a good idea as to how dedicated journalists are to their professional call. Fatigue never comes in the way of their reporting, no matter how odd the hours are. Uh, I think uh, the, this uh, story actually gives the positive aspect of uh, the, the professional attitude of general journalists. So that's why I am, I am giving particular examples. Speaking in the same breath, let me, let me address any, uh, and nullify a popular but false notion. I refuse to believe that India Shining campaign was a flop. That, um, I'm, I think, but unfortunately it couldn't happen uh, because um, of certain reasons. But uh, uh, in our campaign management, it was considered as, in internationally also, I, uh, I think it was a good campaign and uh, people in, in, even in UK and Belgium, I was called to give the, um, the whole concept how the, this conceptualization of campaign was done. <coughs> and after that, uh, the new media, which deserves a special mention. My party, the BJP, has been in the forefront of uh, embracing technology in our scheme of things. I remember how fax was used for the first time, that portable fax machine, as an innovative tool of communication back in 1991 to facilitate filling of reports by journalists on the move. And uh, uh, in 1999 also, for the first time, uh, we uh, ex made an experiment. Uh, when somebody would dial a number, he would be first greeted by a recorded voice message from Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the then Prime Minister. His Namaskar, main Atal Bihari Vajpayee bol raha took the nation by storm. Some people thought initially it was indeed Mr. Vajpayee at the end. Uh, it gave really a very wonderful response throughout the country. Uh, so the, the overall, 
The, the media's role is very important, and it's imperative that political leaders understand the efficacy of media in reaching out the people. To my reckoning, Gujarat Chief Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, leads his uh, peers in the, this regard. Uh, his recently concluded fast in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, for Sadbhavna, Harmony, uh, will be an apt example. The state of Gujarat was always dubbed as a laboratory for Hindutva, or so-called communal forces. This, uh, com commentators, these commentators implied within, with the jargon that the government of this province was anti-minority. But Mr. Modi transformed that questionable term of reference in a politically intelligent manner to rename Gujarat as a laboratory for development, as it is argued, and rightly so, that growth and development benefits all sections of the people, <coughs> both the message of sadbhavna, harmony and goodwill, as well as vikas, development and prosperity, were set directly to the ma masses by Mr. Modi, is, is through smart use of media only. This, as I had said earlier, unders underscores the fact that no publicity can be bad publicity for the political organization if it knows how to use it for a proper direction. <coughs> mm. In last, I would like to mm, point my uh, friends here who are in Australia, right, from Australian origin, from Australia and system and Indian origin people both, that media coverage, uh, it is, uh, you know, an issue which uh, uh, should be dealt very um, cautiously, but uh, the, those incidents in last year, that media coverage of attacks on Indian immigrants in the Victoria province last year would have been handled better. This is my suggestion. Uh, while these attacks have been, uh, were deserved condemnation in strongest terms, well, far worse attacks, which were indeed racist, have occurred elsewhere in the world, but they have been met with far more lenient analysis back in India. The negative reporting adversely affected the Australian education sector and the Australian-Indian relationship in general uh, the most, as inflow of Indian students to this country saw a sharp decline. Appreciating the significance of the Indian media, Australia will therefore do uh, good to reach out uh, it in manner that it reaches out to the media of other countries it deems important. Perhaps it is a time for uh, Australia to review and to us, for us also to review our policy towards each other and, and, and these two em emerging economies of the world. Our state being a democracy, our words are considered more credible in the rest of the world and Australia should therefore be more concerned about how this country is viewed in India. Both Australia and India need to work on this deficit as our commercial ties strengthen, so will our cultural tie as well. And then there will be little room left for misunderstanding e for each other. Conferences and seminars of the type being held here are a move in this direction. Let me congratulate uh, this Australia India Institute. Such dialogues should take place in both the countries more frequently at different levels uh, of uh, confidence building as conf confidence building exercise. I wish the organizers, organizers all the success in their endeavor. You are contributing to the cause of bringing two nations closer. So definitely this is a great job. I place that at this moment, I place that on any such occasion if my services and services of my party colleagues are solicited for the purpose, I will not be found wanting in discharging our responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Navdeep. A very rich group of um, presentations we've had. I want to just uh, take one opportunity before I throw to you. Um, to ask about the, uh, you, you talk, Navdeep, about the importance of young people and some fabulous initiatives that you've taken and how successful they're being. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether you're also thinking of below university students. Are you thinking about schools and students and, and how we're getting a message about foreign policy, about public diplomacy into younger, even younger people? Let me see if this is on. Is I think it is, yes. Yeah, um, we'd love to do that. Uh, it's just that uh, the biggest uh, constraint that we face is bandwidth and resources. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, at the end of the day, there are yeah. four uh, diplomats in our public diplomacy division, and uh, the much hyped uh, digital diplomacy division exists in the form of one young officer <laughs> and uh, maybe 20, 25% of my time. 
And, uh, you know, we try to do more through smart partnerships, uh, usually with young people who are much cleverer than we are. <laughs> um, and, and, and often it has produced very good results for us. Um, but, um, you know, universities, particularly uh, working with uh, departments of international relations and uh, uh, political science and so on, give us a very um, easy, what you might call low-hanging fruit, to pick yeah. uh, where you yeah. can go in with a pre-existing uh, faculty and so on uh, and say, would you like to organize something? And, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's been effective, but yeah, we, the, we'll be the first ones to realize that we need to do much, much more. Mm. I suppose it's about the national story, isn't it? And it goes to your presentation, David, about how do we use schools, use curriculum in public diplomacy. Mm. Okay, we promised questions, so please. Hi, uh, I'm Ashutosh Mishra. Hi, I'm Ashutosh Mishra. Uh, my uh, quick question is to Mrs. Suri. Uh, I love your presentation, every bit of it. And it shows that MEA can also be cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, my quick question is this, sir. When are we going to have the next Festival of India in Australia? Thank you. <laughs> Okay, it's a, probably a question much better directed mm -hmm. to uh, my colleagues in the Indian Council for Cultural Relations because they are the ones who, uh, within our system, have a mandate uh, for uh, carrying out these festivals. Uh, I can take back your uh, interest and convey it, and the High Commissioner of India is here, and I'm sure she's uh, uh, aware of it. I was earlier talking to Nick, and Nick seems to have some thoughts about this that he's, uh, he's planning. Nick? Uh, speak on that. Um, yeah, look, uh, we would be delighted to uh, have a festival of uh, India in Australia or even in Melbourne, Victoria. Um, there's an enormous amount of work, as enough people know, having uh, actually <laughs> actioned a couple of these and, and been the, the host of one in South Africa, uh, to putting one of those together. But I, I see no reason why we shouldn't be able to do one of those here. And again, I, I hopefully have a discussion with the High Commissioner about that too. It would be a wonderful thing. They are uh, extraordinary. And maybe Lachlan, our Deputy Head of Mission from the Australian <laughs> Government, could have a comment there too. Thank you very much. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context, I ran our public diplomacy program for 18 months from 2006 into 2008. So I was Navdeep's um, counterpart. I then moved to Delhi and have been oversighting our public diplomacy activities there for three turbulent, eventful years. I just wanted to offer a couple of quick reflections on the, the, the papers that were put to us. Now, firstly, Navdeep is completely right that listening is critical. It's got to be a two-way street, otherwise you become tone deaf and your, your message just doesn't hit the mark. Secondly, um, it's exactly right that public diplomacy programs have to have a very clear message and a very clear target audience. And often public diplomacy campaigns unravel because they're, they're not focusing on who needs to be influenced and why. There is an in inherent tension in any public diplomacy program between crisis management and long-term opinion changing. And what happens, of course, is that the crisis management being urgent often overwhelms the longer range work. That's particularly important because you have, as Navdeep has pointed out, unfortunately, finite resources. And when you've got budget pressures, those finite resources tend to shrink even further. That becomes more critical when you have a fairly thin understanding of the other country. And one factor which has haunted Australia and India a little bit in the last decade or so is the fact that our understanding of each other is thin, it's a little brittle. So when you have a crisis, that crisis tends to crack through the, th the thinness of the understanding. That's why this kind of conference is so critical. Two, two final points. One is authenticity is absolutely critical. Part of authenticity is being honest, being willing to admit you've made mistakes, and people will spot a fake very quickly and uh, will uh, reject what you're trying to do. The last point I'd make, and this is, I think, a fundamental challenge for all of us, is that all the research indicates that changing a national image is actually relatively difficult. National images are actually quite sticky, they're quite hard to change, I'll give you one quick example, and that is that the Germans with the World Football World Cup ran a massive public diplomacy program in tandem with that. And their opinion polling tracking revealed that the image of India did move for them in the right direction, and they got some very positive results. 
They retested about six months later and unfortunately they found that a lot of the opinion had settled back where it had started from. So that's a slightly pessimistic conclusion in one sense. What it does mean is if you start with some clear strengths in your image, you've got to build on those. So that means in part Australia's clear known strengths we shouldn't reject, we should incorporate them and then the job is to extend them. Uh, my last um, point would be that no publicity is uh, bad publicity. At the height of the student crisis, I did have a lot of my colleagues in Delhi coming to me from other missions saying, will you people please get off the front page? There was no space for us. So to some extent, if there was one positive result of that hideous period, it was that in the end we were forced to rethink things and we were always the topic of conversation and in that we did manage to get some positive messages out eventually. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, Lachlan. Can I just make a quick comment here? Yes, um, sure. Um, thanks very much, Lachlan. And the only comment I'd, I'd make in, by way of response is um, it, it goes to the brand, the image, if you like, that you were talking about. Um, I would distinguish, perhaps this is, I might differ with Navdeep slightly on this, but I, I would differ between the, um, the branding, the Simon Anholt world, and public diplomacy. It seems to me that nation branding is very much about taking identifying core ingredients of how national identity is constituted and moulding them in a way that seems to conjure the right messages and be received favourably overseas. Public diplomacy, to my mind, is more about relationships um, and maybe that goes to your point about slow to change. I, I agree with you, but I'd, I'd, I'd also set nation branding off slightly to one side. Well, I... Uh, just to be fair, I did say that nation branding is inherently controversial. It is uh, an unproven uh, science. Some countries have done it well, some countries uh, have not uh, done it well. In terms of the linkage with public diplomacy, uh, the reason I speak of it is uh, purely in terms of the practicalities of our system because nobody else would be thinking about it in our system uh, at this point of time. So. Uh, the kind of mandate that we have allows us to at least uh, uh, focus some minds uh, on this. You could also say we're not really either or. And in fact, you try to change your brand largely and most effectively through the exchanges and the face-to-face -face mm. contact. So I absolutely agree with that point. Yeah, pretty. This is a question for uh, Dr. S uh, Amitabh Sinha. I was just wondering, you said that the India Shining campaign was not a failure. And, and I would like you to please tell us a little bit about the campaign, the, the target audience for the campaign, and why you think that it was a success. Uh, see, India Shining campaign was planned uh, as per the you know, campaign strategy. The, the trajectory of a campaign is always fixed. So if uh, uh, the, the uh, in, in a market, you uh, know, campaign uh, system in the market, if a product l is being launched at the peak of the campaign, then the product gets hit. Uh, if the campaign uh, uh, falls and after that the uh, product is being launched, it doesn't get proper response. And, uh, almost the similar thing happened during the India Shining campaign. I didn't explain it uh, because of the constraint of time. Uh, it was earlier planned that uh, the India Shining campaign's peak will be around February and March, so the election should be there because it was, you know, uh, uh, an election uh, which was, you know, pre preponed. It was not a normal election. Preponed planned election was there. The, the the party and the cabinet had uh, requested the election commission to prepone it because of certain reasons. So the the election campaign was planned accordingly, but because of certain reasons, the uh, the elections were not, uh, uh, you know, possible to behold on, on that day, on that, that space, that period. So because of that reason, that campaign, uh, um, you know, fallen down and after that the uh, election were held. So that was the reason according to me. So this is my thesis. Any other questions? I've got some. I've got plenty, so you better be careful because otherwise I'll just keep asking questions. <laughs> Yes, in the middle, blinded by the light. Hi, my question is uh, also for Mr. Navdeep Suri. Um, you mentioned the importance of targeting your audience. So I was just wondering whether 
when it comes to Southeast Asia and East Asia, whether India ever tries to tap into its Buddhist heritage um, when trying to appeal to those audiences? Because I know that's something that I think Nehru used to do, but whether that's still being done? Um, when it comes to Indonesia, for example, uh, you know, looking at the kind of cultural heritage that they have, um, both the sort of ancient Hindu uh, past of uh, Ramayana, Mahabharata, the popularity of those, as well as the Islamic heritage in a country that is predominantly Muslim, both of them uh, resonate reasonably well. But I have to tell you that um, uh, during our visit, um, we didn't meet one person who um, hadn't seen My Name is Khan uh, or who uh, hadn't heard. In fact, 100% of the opinion poll unscientifically done by us showed that Shah Rukh Khan was the most popular person <laughs> <laughs> that anybody uh, knew. So I think, uh, you know, it can operate at different levels. We uh, do commission material um, which is aimed at certain geographies. Um, films, for example, we've done a lovely film on Buddhism called Path of Compassion, which has been subtitled or dubbed into multiple languages, into Vietnamese, into Japanese, and so on. We've recently done a very well-acclaimed film on India's Islamic architecture, highlighting the fact that the first mosque goes back to the time when Prophet Muhammad was still alive um, and is in Kerala, contrary to perceived wisdom. Um, and, and, and so, you, you know, these are themes of uh, relating with audiences that you can build upon. Um, and and uh, it's, it's indirect, uh, but it seems to resonate quite well when we, particularly now that we've got our YouTube channel to see the kind of views that we, that we are getting and where they, that we are getting from, it, it gives us a, a, a way to see the responsiveness, even if it's in a very preliminary and uh, shallow sample size at this point of time. It's hard for us to see. You've got to put your hands right in over here. So one of the Ramesh Chakure and you, uh, Mr. Suri, one of the problems that all government departments, all bureaucracies face, is uh, counter pressures from other departments. In the case of public diplomacy. How do you deal with the difficulties created for uh, visitors, tourists, well-wishers by security requirements that have implications, uh, for example, for visas and going in and out? Uh, and it, it must undo a lot of the work you're doing. Uh, and just picking up on the last point that you, in, in terms of your answer, it's always occurred to me that one of the great tourist packages or varieties of them would be experience the Mughal journey throughout the subcontinent in one package. Go to the major monuments, for example, wherever they might be, or the religious factor as well. You can organize very attractive packages for tourists built around religious monuments and history and historical monuments and places. And yet, there are political and security things that militate against that. How do you cope with that in your area? Um, I don't think at this point of the time, a point of time, public diplomacy division makes any pretensions of uh, speaking on behalf of all the other parts of the uh, government of India. In this case, Department of Tourism or Ministry of Home Affairs, which handles the um, visa and security issues. But what we do is. Because of that listening component that, we, uh, that I mentioned, because of our presence on social media, we get a lot of very quick, very rich feedback from people who are um, following us on Twitter or who are friends on Facebook and so on. So we become a, a conduit or a channel to communicate that back to Ministry of Home Affairs saying, look, there seems to be a problem, would you? And, and we are only one of those channels because the ambassadors and high commissioners are writing directly to the Home Secretary or others saying that this is an unnecessary irritant. And if you see that the fact is that those issues did get resolved to a large extent, uh, the initial post-David Headley restrictions that were uh, put into place. On the circuits, uh, there is already a Buddhist circuit that the Department of Tourism is doing, uh, which is... Uh, uh, Varanasi, Bodhgaya, and, and Nalanda. 
uh, and that's quite a popular circuit. In fact, I know a lot of Thai tourists fly directly into uh, Gaya to uh, uh, undertake that particular journey. Um, and I think uh, there is room to, uh, to do a lot more. An Islamic heritage one is probably going to be much harder because of the way it's spread around the country. Uh, and so, uh, you know, are you going to start from Kashmir or are you going to go to Kerala for, for, for that? Uh, probably lends itself to different challenges. But uh, again, I would defer to our tourism department that they are the ones who really have um, the, the first voice on that. And we can be amplifiers of good messaging that comes out of them with the material that we have. Any more questions? attending this conference this conference so for after four days when the date is over they are uh, Messi is asking gives in writing that the event has gone now I am not interested they have not given the visa <laughs> to second person so this is all general happening everywhere so generally scientific conferences and scientific activities visa is no problem I don't know, because I got uh, the invitation on, uh, on Tuesday. Next day I applied, and that fellow applied on Wednesday. So yesterday I got a call that his uh, visa is not granted, but still either we have to refuse or we, you give in writing that I am not interested. Well, this is all um, special kind of things. I was not expecting from Australia, but America and other countries they sometimes they do. We are aware that conference visas uh, has been an issue, but I think uh, some of the responsibility in India falls back on the organizers of the conference. They know exactly the steps that they are required to take in terms of the uh, local paperwork that, uh, procedures. Well, as I'm saying, that there, there is a system uh, that has been put in place by the Ministry of Home Affairs, and it does require obtaining two or three levels of um, clearances, uh, which most conference organizers do in good time so that people can apply well in advance. Um, and, and, and so we do, the reality is that we do see a lot of conferences happening uh, around the country and a lot of people are coming. And it's unfortunate that you've had a particular uh, no, problem. Just a general thing. Any burning questions? Otherwise, um, I'll I'm going to ask one, one last one. The, uh, we haven't really talked about the role of artists. We've talked about Bollywood. We've talked about film. What about writers and artists? Um, if we've started supporting two years back the Jaipur Literature Festival as an example, which is, uh, I think, now regarded as one of the world's largest free literature festivals. And uh, the reason why we started working, one is that it is great to have all of these Nobel laureates and Booker Prize winners and Pulitzer Prize winners and all coming for a literary event um, in Jaipur. But also, we said, how can we take some advantage of an event that is happening where so many great minds are present? <laughs> so last year, for example, and the year before last, we created a panel discussion working with the organizers of the festival uh, called um, Living in a Tough Neighborhood, Challenges for Indian Foreign Policy. Uh, and it was a very robust discussion which had uh, people from Pakistan, from uh, uh, Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh on the panel. In fact, the first year it was Ambassador Sham Saran who was uh, the uh, sort of diplomat panelist. And last year it was Foreign Secretary Nirupmara who was on the, uh, on the panel. So I think it's, you know, whatever we can do to um, strengthen or encourage exchanges, the point that Nick made, uh, that exchanges are so crucial for me, it's my first visit to Australia, my first visit to Melbourne, and I can say that I go back with very different perceptions of this country. So the more we can encourage it in different fields of uh, um, activity, and particularly wherever you can create collaborations um, between artists or painters. or um, we, At the Africa-India Summit in Ethiopia, um, we wanted to bring some non-government people-to-people -people, uh, interaction. And so we worked with 
two NGOs in India, and um, they in turn worked with several in, in uh, I think, 12 different African countries to create an event called Handcrafting Hope. And the whole theme was how can handicrafts be used for financial empowerment, particularly for women. And we had artisans and craftswomen from 12 different African countries in areas like beadwork or uh, painting or uh, bamboo or others collaborating with Indian counterparts and learning from each other how they combine. And I think it's a great public diplomacy exercise to have at that level where people go back with some understanding. And now th that whole group is coming to India in January uh, again for something. So, you know, the sky's the limit. It's the resources that are uh, limited. Exactly. Well, one of the most um, important, I think, initiatives that we've been undertaking over a number of years now is bringing Indian principles, principles of schools, to Australia. And as we've all said, the incredible power of that people to people and the incredible snowball effect that those principals can have with all of their students and communities. Nick. Thanks, Jamie. Um, just as a, a sort of almost a case study, that there is in 2012-13 uh, going to be uh, Ausfest in India, mm -hmm. uh, sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And uh, we're playing a, a very small part in, in some of the activities that are undertaken in at Ausfest. And the way we've been able to engage with artists, writers, performers and so on has been, uh, it's a terribly difficult thing to do. I, I think we all have our own enthusiasms and, and, and there are so many wonderful projects that we could get involved in. But the ones that we've uh, engaged with and, and that we are going to be supporting are those that have best demonstrated uh, a kind of reciprocity. Either an exchange programme, a residency, a continuity. And, and I think that's the important part of this. So these exchanges are going to work it's the continuity of that exchange. So the ones that, uh, in fact, came out of um, a meeting uh, that Asia Link had taken a group of artists, writers and performers to uh, India last year, a couple of the projects that were seeded there are now the ones that we're going to be able to send back to India uh, to re-engage and, and have the opportunity to, I hope, over the years, develop long-standing commitments. There's also an incoming programme of uh, artists in November, who are going to be coming uh, again as AII uh, artist retreat. And again, the, the hope for that is that A, they get to have some substance in Australia, engage with Australian artists, spend some time uh, understanding a little bit more, and, and it's kind of immersion. And then when they go back to India, hopefully they become advocates and ambassadors for what we've done with them. But again, we've created by doing that an opportunity for our own artists to go back and, and engage in India with those people. And I think it, it, it creates, it's a, it's a, well, again, you know, I'm a case in point. I spent two and a half years um, studying uh, the dance, drama, folk form, but nevertheless, that gave me extraordinary engagement and understanding, obviously, of a particular narrow band. But, uh, but that has lasted all the way through to what I now believe to be my kind of, you know, my empathy or my platform. Mm. Thank you. Nick, um, oh, oh, now we've got questions, of course. <laughs> Just going to let you out for a cup of tea, but no. <laughs> my name is Priyanka. I grew up in this country. Um, my question to you is just um, based on a comment that I'm very fascinated at how broad the Indian network is across the world in terms of how internationalised Indians have become. Um, I guess I see Indians, non-residents in particular, as a huge resource that India leaves untapped to a certain degree. And I was wondering how India plans to engage non-resident Indians who also hold... Um, a very um, significant, um, I guess, um, importance in their hearts to India. Um, if there is any plan to kind of engage that NRI community in efforts within India as well as broadcasting Indian culture? Yeah, I think um, we've started now as of last year to work much more closely with our Ministry for Overseas Indian Affairs. Um, I think globally, despite the fact that, of course, we can never do enough to meet all aspirations and requirements, many countries or people who are studying how we work with our diaspora actually see us as a success story. Um, and uh, whether it is the fact that we've got a national day that commemorates the Indian diaspora, which is to mark Mahatma Gandhi's return to India, the fact that we have awards that celebrate the success of the Indian uh, community overseas, uh, which is, again, a major annual award uh, delivered by the president. Um, 
the No India program, which brings young people into India and, and, and uh, at our cost and, and exposes them to uh, heritage and so on, uh, are very interesting programs that we do. Where we are now trying to do is utilizing the platforms that we are creating uh, in the electronic space, combine them with what the Ministry of Overseas Indian Affairs is doing. And I think particularly for the younger generation of the Indian uh, community overseas, I may sound like a bit of a broken record on this, but I think that we will be far more effective using new media uh, in creating the partnerships uh, uh, that enable uh, messages to go out to wider community. For example, what we've already seen is we put something interesting on our YouTube channel and the number of people who are encouraged to share it with others. Uh, and, and so willingly you become an ambassador of that particular product when you've shared it with your friends on Facebook. So I think that's where we would like to take some of these efforts. I'd never say that this would be a substitute to direct personal contact or engagement, but hey, there are a lot of us uh, around uh, to engage with, and there are very few at the other end. So the more we can use new media, the better it will be for us. Yes. Uh, I'm Harminder Singh uh, from Deakin University, Melbourne. Uh, I've got an observation uh, slash question from Navdeep. Uh, if we just go around 18 months ago in Australia, there were a few opportunistic attacks on Indian students, and uh, there were lots of issues raised out of that which I think Australian media has handled very well, and Australian government also has taken a lot of steps within the next 12 months, like a lot of visits by vice chancellors to India, a lot of visits by university uh, people, uh, police playing cricket with the Indian boys here in, in, uh, on the streets of Melbourne, and somehow things repaired within a span of 12 months, and as of today, it looks like when we're on the streets of Melbourne that it never happened. But on the other side in India, I mean, the media played uh, informative role definitely at that time, but the media played a kind of negative role also at that stage. I mean, uh, I would like to share with my Australian friends, the number of TV channels in India are uh, slightly less than the Melbourne's population. So <laughs> every channel was telling different sort of story at that stage. Uh, uh, Mike, no question goes back to uh, Navdeep. I mean, this particular platform of your public diplomacy is a very good platform uh, in repairing the image. I mean, Australia is not looked upon as bad brother as it was 18 months ago or 12 months ago, but as not as good guy as it was in 80s and late 70s or mid 80s and so on. So your reflection, Navdeep, thanks. Um. If the suggestion is um, that um, the Indian government should have at least as much influence on the Indian media as the Australian government has on Australian media, I couldn't agree more <laughs> with you. you know, <laughs> more power to all of us in, 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 in government. But since in the real world it doesn't quite work uh, that way. Um, you know, there was a, 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 last night the dinner speech at, at least some of the, the, the people who were there. Uh, which um, uh, Sushi Das gave about the role that media played, and I think it drew a multitude of reactions, that the Indian media portrayed a part of the story. Uh, and in their rush for TRP ratings and so on, I think they got carried away with this sense of outrage and indignation that they wanted to portray to um, mobilize uh, public opinion uh, for what at least some channels saw as a very evangelist uh, cause. But where I differ is that the issue is not alive now. Uh, I think uh, the story itself had a limited shelf life. Uh, and once things quietened down um, here, and once the right messages started going, you know, sometimes in public forums, we are not in, uh, at liberty to say all that was done behind the scenes to calm things down. Uh, all I limit myself to saying is, just because you didn't hear it from us doesn't mean it didn't happen. Uh, and, and a lot was actually done to uh, calm the ruffled feathers at that time. And uh, the fact is that today it's not an issue in the Indian media. Last question. My name is Rohini Kavadath from Picture Partners. 
Um, the point I wanted to make was that our younger generation tend to be, you know, very clear thinking today and very articulate, and they're big on outcomes and small on ceremony and hype. How does the public diplomacy program propose to manage the rise of ac activism in India, which I think is, we're already seeing the start of that through, you know, Anna Hazari's campaign and so on, and given the access that the younger people have to digital media, we're going to see a lot more of that. How do you propose to manage that? going forward? By being present actively in that space, um, the worst thing that we can do is that there's a lot of action happening in that space when you talk about Anna Hazare and the way, again, social media was used uh, by the campaign to mobilize people to come for the protest and so on. Um, we had caused a loss to ourselves and government if we are not present in that space to engage with them vigorously uh, and give at least our viewpoint um, to those who are active in that, in that space. Um, we know that we, when we, for example, become active on Twitter, there will be a lot of criticism. And one of the things that you uh, learn as you go along is that we as public diplomats, as opposed to those who are sheltered behind uh, various walls, uh, need to develop a slightly thicker skin in terms of accepting criticism. Uh, and criticism is plentiful. Our approach so far has been engage, see if it helps in diffusing some of the hostility um, that people ha sometimes come forth with. But even if people get too um, aggressive, uh, maybe abusive sometimes, uh, and that's part of the phenomenon, our approach has been ignore but don't block. Um, and, and that's a, an approach that's uh, worked fairly well uh, uh, in the limited time that we've been in this area where I think the satisfaction that somebody has that he's been able to vent at a government official uh, it, it, it seems to help matters. <laughs> <laughs> What a wonderfully optimistic place to leave this debate and discussion. That was uh, really inspiring for us, actually, in Australia, Navdeep, to leave it, leave it on that note. Uh, we have a bit of a, an issue at the moment about e-diplomacy and uh, some challenges out to our government to be a bit more activist in this space. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amitav. Thank you very much, Nick and David. It was a really fabulous session and thank you very much for excellent questions. <laughs>